This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Anxiously watching the currency exchange. <laughs> 84 rubles for onion. Regular, onion, regular onion. How much was it? Four times 20 rubles. Four times. Look, we need to talk about Russia's economy. It's true that Western sanctions are wrecking unprecedented havoc upon it at the moment, but Russia's economy actually has a bigger, more structural problem. This problem ensured that Russia's economy never became a true economic superpower. Instead, Russia's economy has been characterized by cycles of stagnation, inflation, collapse and rebirth. And yes, this also happened under Putin. After a period of tremendous growth, Russia's economy stagnated, never really reaching its full potential. And with high inflation, even before the war in Ukraine, hardworking Russians had seen their purchasing power drop by roughly a third since 2013. So why is Russia's economy seemingly doomed to volatile cycles of stagnation, inflation, collapse and rebirth? Well, to answer that question, we need to go back in time. No, no, we'll get to that point, but for this story to truly make sense, we need to go back further in time. The year is 1916 and Russian troops are waging bloody war on a Western front. On the surface, Russia's economy is really solid. Its economy is rather self-sufficient, it does not rely on foreign capital, and it has built up one of the largest piles of foreign exchange reserves in the world. However, for the people of Russia, the picture is not as rosy. Their incomes have stagnated, while at the same time prices have risen by over 130% over the course of two years. This combination of stagnation and inflation meant falling purchasing power for ordinary Russians. And this was becoming a big problem for Russia's authoritarian leader, Tsar Nicholas II. Sure, the war had rallied sentiment initially, but in hugely unequal Russia, as people saw their money evaporate, they started turning against the ruling elite. And as newly formed Soviet Russia was engulfed in revolutionary turmoil, regular inflation eventually turned into hyperinflation. Until a strong leader eventually took charge and stabilized the state and its currency. However, it was only during the 1950s that the Russian economy really came into its own. This period became known as the Soviet Growth Miracle. This growth miracle was so potent that Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Samuelson even kept predicting that the Soviet economy would outgrow that of the United States. On the other hand, if we follow the logic of free market economists such as von Mises and Hayek, then the Soviet growth miracle really shouldn't have happened at all. You see, they argue that the bureaucratic state cannot hope to grow an economy because it can never really know which of the millions of sectors to invest in. And I think that there they have a good point. After all, there are already more than 350 million product types sold on the Amazon marketplace. How can government bureaucrats ever find out how to produce each of these 350 million products and in what quantity to produce them? However, the thing is, after years of conflict and even hyperinflation, the Soviet Union was dirt poor. So it didn't need 350 million product categories. It just needed basic products such as food and heavy industry. And for that, it just needed basic institutions such as an education system, a health system and a transportation system. And as it turns out, these were exactly the types of institutions that the stabilized state of the Soviet Union had put into place during the 30s and 40s. So if you look at it like that, it makes total sense that the Soviet economy could grow very rapidly in the 1950s. And it also makes sense that the Soviet economy then stalled after it had almost caught up with Western economies. After all, this is where the 350 million product categories from Amazon come in. After the economy had reached a basic level, further growth became extremely difficult to oversee for the highly centralized state. On top of that, in advanced economies, growth typically happens through innovation. And innovation brings new businesses to the forefront, which likely means that some old business interests lose. However, in Soviet Russia, this process known as creative destruction was held back by precisely these old business interests. So then how was the economy to grow now that easy catch-up growth was depleted? Luckily for Soviet Russia and especially its governing elites, booming oil and gas exports provided relief. 
What's more, the state used the proceeds of these exports to build up a large war chest of foreign exchange reserves. However, for the people of Russia, the picture was not so rosy. Their incomes had stagnated and sure, price controls prevented inflation, but this led to a phenomenon known as repressed inflation. This basically means that because prices are prohibited from rising, massive shortages emerge. So as stagnation went from bad to worse, the Soviet Union tried to modernize and let go of these price controls, turning repressed inflation into actual inflation of about 8 to 9%. And then when this didn't work, it just tried to spend itself out of trouble, which increased inflation even further. And then as the Soviet Union collapsed, this higher inflation even turned to hyperinflation. And this is the situation that the new Russian economy started out with. Now, some influential scholars have actually argued that Russia made a crucial mistake in moving too quickly from a command and control economy to a capitalist economy. Because it happened so rapidly, this process is even known as the Big Bang. However, economist Branko Milanovic points out that at the time the Soviet economy was already in so much trouble that the new president, Boris Yeltsin, basically has no other option than just to let go of all price controls at the same time in a Big Bang. The one thing where he did have a choice though is whether or not to sell off all state industries to his friends for pennies on the dime. And unfortunately for Russia, Yeltsin's buddies got some pretty sweet deals. Creating once again massive inequality in Russia. And while in 1997 the Russian economy finally seemed to be back on the right track, the state was still extremely weak and unable to collect taxes. So when global capital got scared during the Asian financial crisis, a global run on the ruble followed. This led to a default by the weak Russian state and it also led to the ruble to collapse once again. What followed was sky-high inflation of roughly 85%. And this is when a new ambitious young prime minister with a new economic plan in his drawer enters the picture. Один из вариантов, который разрабатывается и рассматривается в качестве возможного, одного из возможного вариантов. Indeed, you could say that in 1999, a strong leader stood up, centralized the state, and the Russian economy once again began to thrive as it caught up to other nations. Okay, you could also argue that the eightfold increase in oil and gas prices at that time was rather convenient. And while inflation was still high, the average spending power of Russians increased from roughly $1,800 in 2002 to a whopping $16,000 in 2013. Okay, sure, you could argue that the average Russian spending power didn't increase by that much because much of the spoils went to Putin's friends and associates. As under Putin, Russia also became one of the most unequal nations on earth. But still, poverty also dropped from roughly 25% of the population in 2002 to roughly 10% in 2013. And sure, you could argue that this catch-up growth was easy because Russia still had its well-educated population, fertile land and wealth of resources. But as far as I could tell, there was genuine effort to rebuild Russia's institutions to work better for ordinary Russians. For example, under the so-called Graf Reform Program, barriers to opening a business were lowered. What's more, the state's tax collection apparatus was improved and so was its ability to provide crucial services to ordinary Russians for them to be able to build their businesses. So now both the essential state services were in place and there was also a more decentralized economy that could foster creative destruction. This was clearly Russia's time to shine, right? Well, yeah, at the time it really seemed that way. This is when Russia's economy was globally recognized as part of the BRIC Rising Nations Group, where BRIC stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China. This group would soon dominate the global economy. As a consequence, an influx of foreign investment and businesses flowed into the country and the economy was booming and the ruble was strengthening. No wonder that Putin became so popular. And sure, the Russian economy was hit pretty hard by the global financial crisis, but it bounced back rapidly reaching an all-time high in 2013. Outside a Ukrainian military base here in Crimea, but the soldiers over here are Russian. 
Крым – это наше общее достояние и важнейший фактор стабильности в регионе. И эта стратегическая территория должна находиться под сильным, устойчивым суверенитетом, который по факту может быть только российским сегодня. Now, in response to the annexation, the Russian economy was sanctioned by Western powers. But what was even worse is that the price of oil just happened to collapse at the same time. So the ruble fell, and because this meant that imports became much more expensive, inflation soared to 16% in 2015. Stagnation and inflation was more rather than investing them in the economy, the proceeds of oil and gas exports would now be used to build up an impressive war chest of foreign reserves. And the idea behind this would be to insulate Russia from future sanctions. The problem is that foreign exchange reserves are invested abroad and not locally. Not only is this bad for future growth, investment also represents income for the people of Russia. And with less income, Russians buy less stuff, meaning that other Russians now also have less income. After all, the economy is a circular system. That's how macroeconomics is different from microeconomics. On top of that, the state became increasingly heavy-handed and authoritarian, and it promised reforms to make business for locals easier, stalled. The best state businesses started going more and more to Putin's friends rather than to the best Russian businesses. As a consequence of underinvestment and corruption, Russia's crucial pro-growth institutions then started to deteriorate. In that light, it's not surprising that some of Russia's most talented individuals started leaving Russia and starting businesses in Europe instead. To make matters even worse, because the dark, inflationary days of the 90s were so uncertain, Russian women basically stopped having children. And that now means that there are now fewer Russians to also make fewer children. Combine this with the government's mishandling of the coronavirus crisis and the Russian economy almost lost 1 million people last year. In that light, it certainly makes sense that Putin apparently said that what really haunts him is Russia's declining population. So, how can Russia's economy break free of its cycle of stagnation, inflation, collapse and rebirth? Well, let's see if we can find some common patterns in Russia's previous cycles. But in hugely unequal Russia, as people saw their money evaporate, they started turning against the ruling elite. Until a strong leader eventually took charge and stabilized the state and its currency. However, in Soviet Russia, this process known as creative destruction was held back by precisely these old business interests. Luckily for Soviet Russia and especially its governing elites, booming oil and gas exports provided relief. However, for the people of Russia, the picture was not so rosy. Their incomes had stagnated. And then as the Soviet Union collapsed, this higher inflation even turned to hyperinflation. Strong leaders stood up, centralized the state, and the Russian economy once again began to thrive. Rather than investing them in the economy, the proceeds of oil and gas exports would now be used to build up an impressive war chest that the state became increasingly heavy-handed and authoritarian. As we can clearly see, the Russian economy is doing the worst when the state is in disarray and weak. With these experiences in mind, it makes more sense that sometimes the Russian population supports some relatively authoritarian leaders. And these authoritarian leaders are actually able to bring some amazing periods of growth from time to time. However, their rule typically ends with a period of stagnation and inflation and eventually collapse until the story starts all over again. So how to break the cycle at that point? Well, here I'm going to refer to a theory put forward by famous economists James Robinson and Darren Asimoglu. I actually have the book here in the back. Here, in this book, The Narrow Corridor. In this book, they basically say that for advanced level growth, a strong but constrained state is needed. On the one hand, the state should be strong enough to provide the basic institutions and currency stability that is needed for growth. At the same time, the state should be constrained enough so that it doesn't hinder the process of creative destruction in the private sector. And so I would say that this is the real problem that Russia's economy is facing. Unlike countries such as Japan, South Korea and Germany, which also started out with strong authoritarian states, the Russian state was never shackled and therefore always got out of control until it broke down and so did the economy. At which point the cycle starts again. But hey, these are just my thoughts on the matter. And before moving on to current sanctions, onto the sponsor of this video, which is Squarespace.
Squarespace provides a powerful online platform for which you can create your very own website. For creators, Squarespace really helps you to connect with your audience and generate revenue because it allows you to create gated member-only content. What's more, it allows you to manage your members, send them emails and leverage audience insights all in one easy to use platform. So if that sounds good, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash money macro to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain. And finally, if you want to know more about the impact of Western sanctions on Russia's economy, check out this video over here. And if you want to see other stories of the rise and fall of major economies, check out this playlist over here. And finally, consider supporting the channel if you like this video using the Patreon or Ko-Fi links in the description.